right, so we are on chapter seven, section three. And last time when we were in class, we talked all about the different types of reaction mechanisms, how enzymes work. But in this section, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about three specific different enzymatic reaction mechanisms. And they're really based on protein structures and um, data collected from in vitro kinetics. And so you'll see, pretty good level of detail in here. Um, and you'll see that all of these mechanisms are multiple steps. And that's exactly what we saw in those um, kinetic diagrams from last time, is that we have to go through multiple steps. And so um, each one of these reactions is going to reinforce two core concepts in enzymology. And here are our two core concepts, right? Um, substrates bind to enzyme active sites through weak non-covalent interactions. And that's what allows for the orientation of the, the functional groups, right, that are in close proximity to that substrate reactive center. So this, is, this allows for the orientation, correct orientation. Um, and then the enzymes are going to use a conventional catalytic reaction mechanism. And it's not chemistry you don't know. You already know all of this acid-base chemistry and things like that. So everything, um, reduction, uh, oxidation reduction mechanisms, all that you already know from organic chemistry. So that won't be new. All right, so let's talk about our first one. Our first um, enzyme that we're gonna talk about is chemotrypsin. Now we've already sort of talked about this, right? We've talked about chemotrypsin, that the whole purpose of chemotrypsin is to cleave a pretty big peptide, right? And so chemotrypsin actually has three chains, and those three chains are the A, B, and C chains. And those chains for the enzyme itself are covalently linked with disulfide bonds. Remember we talked about that, it's disulfide bonds that link peptides together to form a complex or an enzyme, something like that. So for this particular enzyme, the active site is actually on the surface of the molecule. So this is on surface. And it kind of makes sense because chemotrypsin is working on a huge molecule, a huge polymer substrate. So you don't want its active site to be deep inside of a pocket. You want it to kind of be on the outside. And so chemotrypsin is going to digest and cleave the backbone of our dietary protein. That's we use it in chemistry um, in trying to determine a peptide sequence, right? And we know where chemotrypsin cleaves, but that's us utilizing it in science. What it does normally in the body is to cleave our dietary proteins. And so it's super important for the body, right? And so you're going to see two different mechanisms here. You're going to see a covalent catalysis and you're going to see an acid base catalysis. And so what you're going to see specifically in chemotrypsin, but that's really common in all serine proteases. So this is all serine proteases um, that they're going to have this catalytic triad. And this triad is histidine, asparagine, and um, serine. And they're going to form a hydrogen bond network that's going to allow catalysis to happen. And so in this triad, the serine itself is going to be converted to a highly reactive nucleophile. So if we kind of zoom in, kind of zoom in, right, on our little diagram. So this is just a stick model diagram of the amino acid residues that are, that are super important in this mechanism. And so what you'll see is the asparagine and the histidine, these are from the B chain, not the C chain, the B chain. Say one thing, write another. <laughs> um, down here, our serine is from the C chain. Okay, so the serine 195 is our catalytic residue right here. So this is our catalytic residue. And this is what's gonna form our enzyme substrate covalent intermediate right? Because we, remember we said that that's what happens when we use an enzyme. We make an intermediate and we make a covalent intermediate. So our histidine and our asparagine function together to convert our serine 195 into that highly reactive nucleophile. 
And so what you'll see is you'll see an interaction with asparagine 102 and the proton from serine 195. And you'll see that that gets transferred to the Hiss 57 imatazole ring. So here, this hydrogen right here is the one that's actually going to get transferred. And you'll see that it's now bound to the Hiss right here. So this one's Hiss. Right, there's our ring. And so we see that that proton was attached to serine and is now attached to histidine. Okay, so if we go and look in detail at our, I know, I know, it's lots of steps, but it's not so bad. We're going to take it one at a time, right? Look at our, our reaction mechanism. So what we're going to see in this overall mechanism is that we're going to make two different intermediates. And so we're going to kind of track what happens um, and how we get that. So the first thing is that we're going to have our polypeptide that's going to bind to an enzyme active site. So here's, here's our, our active site. And remember that chemotrypsin is specific for certain residues, right? It only cleaves in certain places. Well, why is that? Because we have a substrate specificity pocket. So we have this pocket and guess what fits right in the pocket? Whoa. Guess what fits right in the pocket? Something with an aromatic ring, okay? So if we have our aromatic ring, it's gonna fit perfectly in our enzymatic pocket, right? And so once it fits into the pocket, what's gonna happen is our Hiss 57, so this one, this one right here is Hiss 57. It's going to remove that protein from serine, right? So here's, here's serine. And it's going to remove that hydrogen. So the, the, the Hiss wants to pick up the hydrogen. So now Hiss is going to have the hydrogen, right? And that's going to allow for a nucleophilic attack by the serine oxygen on the carbonyl, 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 oh my God, for the carbonyl carbon of the peptide. So what happens is because this hydrogen right here gets um, pulled up by the Hiss, right? Now we have this oxygen here that can go in and kind of attack this carbon right here, this carbonyl carbon. Okay, so what happens when that happens? We go down, see if I can do this. <laughs> so our Hiss 57 is gonna donate a proton to the amino group of our substrate. Okay, so if the, now, now that Hiss has the, the hydrogen right here, okay, right here, right? Now we're gonna transfer it from the Hiss and we're gonna transfer it to our substrate. So now we're gonna get peptide bond cleavage because of that substrate. So right here, we're going to get our peptide bond cleavage. And so the carboxy terminal fragment is going to be released, right? We're going to get rid of it. And that's going to be our first product. So here's our first product that got kicked out, right? So the same thing is right here. That's our first bit that gets kicked out of the uh, enzyme. Okay. Now that that get, get, gets kicked out, water, there's a space there. And so now water can enter our active site. When water, here's our water, enters that active site, the Hiss 57 is going to act as a general base. Remember, we talked about this last class. When it's a general base, it's going to remove a proton from that water. And so let me see if I can show that, right? That's right here. It removes the proton from the water. So now we have an OH. The OH minus is going to act as a nucleophile, and it's going to attack the carbonyl carbon of our uh, covalent intermediate. So here's that attack right here. There's your attack. Okay, now what's going to happen after that attack is the Hiss is going to donate a proton to the serine 195, right? So if it donates a proton, then you're gonna get cleavage of our intermediate, right? And so, so here's our second tetrahedral intermediate. We had an intermediate when we formed our covalent interaction earlier, here's our second tetrahedral intermediate. Um, now that we've made that intermediate, we can release the other end of our fragment, right? And then we want to regenerate what we originally had. And so um, this is the part that is then going to be uh, released, right? If we go ahead and release that, 
Now we've regenerated our enzyme. We have all of our original um, residues there. We, we're ready to pick up the next peptide and make the next cleavage, right? So our functional catalytic triad is regenerated. So that's the whole point of having an enzyme is that at the end of its entire pathway, what's going to happen is you, you regenerate the enzyme so it doesn't get um, used up. And so it's all about a lot of transfer of protein, protons to make that happen. All right, so when we talked about the different enzymes, you'll remember that if we're gonna talk about a degradation, right? If you're gonna do like Edmund degradation, you're gonna pick different enzymes and they're gonna cleave at different spots in the peptide bond, in the peptide backbone. So why is that? Well, what you'll see is that the different enzymes have different pockets. So they have different residues within the substrate binding pocket. So chemotrypsin, for example, has a huge space. I mean, this is, this is so open here. So you can bind things that have aromatic residues that are huge, that take up tons of space, like tyrosine. So that's why chemotrypsin cleaves at particular places in the peptide bond. Think about trypsin, on the other hand. Trypsin has a binding pocket with a negatively charged residue. Well, if trypsin has a negatively charged residue, right, what's it gonna do? It's gonna accommodate residues that have a positive charge, like arginine, like lysine, right? So it's gonna cleave pep proteins at peptide bonds that border positively charged residues. Look at the last one, elastase. Elastase is an enzyme that um, works on the, the protein called elastin. Now, elastin is super interesting because elastin is really, really rich in glycine and alanine residues. Well, in elastase, what we see is a tiny, 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 tiny binding pocket. So only really small residues like alanine um, and glycine can actually be accommodated in the active site. And so those are the only substrates that actually get cleaved. So the, the binding pocket will tell you the specificity of um, what different substrates that enzyme can work on. All right, let's talk about our second example, enolase, which is a metallo enzyme. So this is a glycolytic enzyme. It's used also in gluconeogenesis, um, but it really functions as a dimer. So um, the green is one half of the dimer and the yellow is the other half. And so each of these, they call them monomers. So here's one monomer, here's one monomer, right? So each of the monomers has an active site, has an enzymatic active site, but in order for it to function, it needs to be a dimer. And so each of the active sites contains two divalent metal ions that are required for catalysis. So if we kind of zoom in, I don't like how they did this. Um, they, they drew you a metal ion, right, inside of the active site, and they put you a substrate, but it's actually two metal ions. It's not just one. So I don't know if that's how they crystallized it with only one, and that's why they're showing that structure, but it's actually two um, Mg2 plus ions that have to be inside of that pocket. Okay, so this particular enzyme is going to use general acid base, general acid base catalysis, um, and it's gonna use our metal ion catalysis. So types of catalysis, catalysis, okay? So it's kind of important to, to know what's gonna happen before you look at the mechanism, right? So um, you know in general acid base that you're gonna have some transfer of ions of transfer of protons. Um, and then we're gonna look at specifically what that metal ion is important for in this enzyme. So here's our active site, and they at least put two magnesium ions in this one, so I'm very proud of them for that. <laughs> so um, how does this active site facilitate these interactions? Well, you have um, negatively charged, let me, let me kind of highlight some things here. So we have our negatively charged aspartate and glutamate. So we have an aspartate here, we have a glutamate here, and see these right here? These are going to um, bind the positively charged metal ions, right? So these are negative, 
And so they're going to interact with those positively charged uh, magnesium ions in order to kind of stabilize um, the metal ions. All right, uh, oh, and this one too. <laughs> All right, so, and this one too, there you go. Okay, so the other thing that you have to think about um, is how is this active site going to bind with our substrate? And so our substrate is kind of, let's see if I can highlight it a different color. This is our substrate, this thing right here. This is our substrate that we're gonna act on, okay? So what we have are some residues that are gonna actually interact with um, the substrate. So HIS-159 right here is gonna interact with our substrate, right? And, and it makes actually a hydrogen bond with the phosphoryl group on the substrate, right? Um, the other thing that's important in here that we're going to look at in the mechanism in just a second, here are our arginine and our lysine residues, our arginine and our lysine residues. Um, these are going to be involved in making lysine 345 um, a general base, G -N -E, a general base in the reaction. And oh, and last but not least, we have our lysine 396. Now our lysine 396 um, is gonna make an ionic interaction with the substrate. So you have some residues that are working to stabilize the magnesium ion. You have some that are gonna function in the general um, acid base category. So you have different residues within the active site that are doing different jobs. And so it's gonna be important to kind of keep track of all the different things that are happening within the enzyme active site. It's actually pretty complicated. <laughs> all right, so if we look at our first, our first kind of organization here, right, we have our lysine 345 right here, and it is going to act as a general base, right? So this is the general base. So if it acts as a general base, what's it gonna do? it's gonna remove a proton. So here's the proton that it is going to remove. And it's gonna remove that proton from our substrate. And it's carbon two in our substrate, but it doesn't really matter that you know which carbon. Um, but the point is that it's gonna remove that, that proton. Okay, so what do you end up with when you remove that proton? Well, when you remove that proton, you get a carb anion intermediate, okay? And so, which you'll notice now is that when you remove this hydrogen, what happened was you lost the double bond right here on this carbon oxygen. And so when you lose that double bond and the double bond then goes in between the two carbons right there, what you're gonna see is now you have two oxygen atoms here who are negatively charged. And so you have a lot of negatively charged molecules going on right there. And so it's really, really important that you have these two magnesium ions to stabilize those negative charges. And we call that the carbooxalate. All right. Okay, so now, now we have a stabilization of our, our anion intermediate here. And that's, and that's a good thing, right? We were stabilizing it. Because if you didn't have these magnesium ions inside of there, this reaction would not go at all. All right, so now we're gonna have, if we kind of come down, we have our glutamate 211. Glutamate's going to donate a proton to the hydroxyl, okay? So here's our glutamate right here, and it's going to donate this hydrogen right there. It's gonna donate that to our intermediate, right? And so if it's donating that, hydrogen, it's going to act as our acid, and it's going to result in the elimination um, of water and the formation of our phosphoenol pyruvate, okay? So if we look, go down a little bit, right? We're going to release water, and then we're going to form our, our final product, right? And so this product can then be released. So the important thing to understand, if this is a metallo enzyme. What did the ions actually do? Well, what we didn't say, one of the things we didn't say is that they're actually going to help to orient the substrate, right? Because we have a, a negatively charged end of our substrate. Well, that's going to interact with the positively charged uh, ions. So, so 
what do the ions do? What do the ions do, right? They're going to orient substrate. That's part of it. Um, in that first step, we created a really strong ionic interaction um, with the ion and, um, and that C2, right? So, so you're going to make interactions between ionic interactions with the intermediates, right? Because we're trying to facilitate this enzymatic reaction to go forward. So if we can make these enzymatic intermediates um, easier to form with our metal ions, then, um, then we can catalyze the reaction. So then once our C2 proton was removed, our magnesium ion actually stabilized the increasing negatively charged um, intermediate. So you not only have ionic interactions with the intermediate, but you're going to stabilize the negatively charged intermediate. So this reaction would not go at all if you did not have these, um, these metallic ions in order to facilitate that, all those interactions. All right, the last one is MG-CoA reductase. This is an enzyme that's involved in cholesterol biosynthesis. So you, this is, remember if you in, remember the very beginning, the first um, recorded lecture, I talked about how if we could decrease serum levels of um, cholesterol, right? How could we do that? We could inhibit cholesterol synthesis inside of the body, and then cells would take up cholesterol from the serum. So that's exactly what we can do with this, um, with this reaction. So if we understand how biosynthesis works, then we can create an inhibitor. So this is an enzyme involved in cholesterol biosynthesis, making it, right? And it has four active sites for our substrate that's eventually going to turn into cholesterol. And we need a cofactor for this reaction. So this is the first time we're really talking about cofactor. And this is a membrane bound um, enzyme and it's got, uh, it's a tetrameric enzyme. So it's got four active sites and the four active sites are between the monomers, right? And so our active site is going to bind the HGM-CoA, right? So this is what our active site binds. And it's going to bind our cofactor of NADPH. And we're actually going to need two NADPHs to make the reaction go. And so this NADPH is going to catalyze the reduction. So it's going to be four, a four electron reduction of HMG-CoA, and it's going to make CoA and um, melavonate. Okay, so let's see what our mechanism looks like. All right, so if we kind of zoom in, right? All right, what we're starting out with, we're starting out with HMG-CoA. So where's our HMG-CoA? trying to highlight it. So this molecule right here is our HMG-CoA. That's what we're starting with. All right. So the first thing that's going to happen is something to do with our cofactor. So our cofactor is NADPH. The NADPH is going to transfer one of those hydrogens and it's going to attack the carbonyl of HMG-CoA. So here's that carbonyl carbon right here. And that's what's going to be attacked in the, in the first step, right? So when that happens, what we're going to see is we're going to see that glutamate is going to act as a general acid, and it's going to protonate um, that oxygen that's on the HMG-CoA. So if we look at our product, right, what happened, we added two hydrogens to it. The first hydrogen here is from NADPH, and the second hydrogen here is from glutamate. So now we have um, this, this, ana, this oxy anion transition state going on with our molecule. And, um, and our lysine, which is positively charged, remember your structures, is going to stabilize this intermediate form. And that's exactly what we need. So now we have a stabilized intermediate. We're going to kick out um, that NADP, and then we're going to bring in another NADPH. We bring in another NADPH, and what's going to happen in this one is that our, um, our glutamate is now going to act as a general base. So what you'll see is that it's going to pick up this hydrogen right here. 
And so when that happens, right, Hiss is at the same time going to donate a proton to CoA. So this um, proton is going to be donated to um, the CoA. So if we move to the next step, what we see, right, is that we have now broken our original substrate. So we had that hydride transfer, right? So we added another hydrogen from another NADPH. We've attached our hydrogen, but now that we've broken the bond, right, what's gonna happen is our glutamate's now gonna act as a general acid. And so it's gonna transfer this hydrogen back <laughs> to our substrate. And if I could always move the screen, all right, now um, we get our reduction occurring. So, so we have our reduction of our aldehyde and we're getting that additional um, hydrogen attached. And so now we have our two, um, our two products. We have our CoA and we have our, <clears throat> excuse me, melavonate. So we've reached our final step and we've regenerated our enzyme um, into its original state. All right, so that is our last, I believe that's our last, our last enzyme mechanism. Yep, that's our last enzyme mechanism. All right, so you've had the three and you've seen that each of the three are going to use more than one mechanism when they are undergoing their catalytic activity. So it's important that you understand that it's not just um, using a metal. It's not just having acid-base catalysis. It's pretty much always going to be a combination of more than one reaction mechanism occurring for one enzyme. All right, have a great rest of your day.